Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Film Club Podcast, where every month we deep dive into a different aspect of cinema, directors, actors, genres, or franchises. It doesn't matter, because it's always fun at the Film Club. I'm Dean. I'm Becky. And this month, we're doing November, and we're doing something special for this November. We're picking movies that we've never seen before. Well, they're being picked by guests. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We're not picking movies this month. We're having brand new movies that neither of us have seen before with guests, and we have a guest today. It's me. I'm back. Brandon, go ahead, Dean. Get another sip of water before you choke again. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'll I, stall for you. I've returned. You, I'm, the last I'm appearance dying. of mine has been gone into the sands of Egypt. It has. Like but, the Scorpion King. Yes. Gone. We will, we will eventually gone. go back and redo Scorpion King. But he has risen from wild. the ashes. He's back like, with another Western, I believe. Howdy. Yes, uh, you have famously been great on this podcast for picking weird movies we have never heard before and them just being solid gold. Are they weird, though? I don't feel they're weird. It's no, just movies not, we've never seen before. Yeah, yeah, maybe not weird, but hard to find movies. Like, yeah. The Stranger was one I'm like... Yeah, the strange thing is that that was at the beginning of this year. That was. Uh, but this week, you bring us Pale Rider. Eastwood's 1985 Western, uh, his last Western before he does Unforgiven, right? Yeah, and only Western of the 80s that he did. Oh, and it, it was the most successful Western of the 80s. Yes, but, you know, take in mind, it's the 80s for Westerns. Nothing was a mega hit. It is wild to think that the Western was the Hollywood genre for, what, 40 years, 50 years? Since the start? Since, yeah, pretty, since pretty the much, dawn of uh, film. Uh, John Ford's... Um, like Stagecoach, right? Stagecoach. And that was like 39. Yeah. And the 80s were just like, no, no more Westerns. At least no big studio Westerns come out in the 1980s other than this. And even this was a small budget. Yeah, but Warner Brothers, so... Warner yeah. Brothers will release anything? <laughs> no, well, they'll release anything their consistent directors want. And Eastwood was a consistent director still at this is point. For them. Yeah, it is. Is it still weird to anyone else that Eastwood's in his nineties and still releasing like mainstream Hollywood flicks? No, like he's he's a decade older than Scorsese and he's still releasing movies. Yeah, I mean, I think he's the opposite side of Scorsese. If Scorsese would be like the greatest director of all time, ding, ding. Um, that was a good. Uh... That was a good bullet point there. Hit Scorsese, yeah, yeah, yeah. the goat. Ding, ding, ding. Uh, then I think Eastwood would be the most underrated he is the... director of all time. Because his acting career and like his early, like his super hits overshadow like his directorial career. Like you think of his acting, then you think of Unforgiven. Like, what is it? Unforgiven, Million Dollar Baby, yeah. um, Gran Turismo. And those are like his two like 90s up ones but he did like play misty for me and he did a Aloha josie wales yeah. um it is it is weird to think because i i agree with you that eastwood is probably the most consistent kind of journeyman style director at this point he'll do basically anything like he shows a lot of range yes you know? like even like if you think about space cowboys Oh, with, that was uh, an Eastwood movie, too? That's an Eastwood movie, and there's a lot of CGI and effects there, and you would have never thought Clint would be the dude doing a space movie. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm watching, you know, we're watching Pale Rider, and I'm like, Brandon told me this was like a fantasy movie at certain points. All right, I'm kind of seeing it, but I still can't see Eastwood directing like Lord of the Rings or some shit. That's no, just too wild for me. It's more of a, yeah, this is a a pseudo- fantasy pseudo magic what western pseudo- mysticism kind yeah. of thing western yeah um instead of voodoo it's uh uh christian religion yeah miss miss boo over there your thoughts on the man the myth the legend clint eastwood as a director actor thoughts i mean i gotta go with he's one attractive man and even at Especially this at age at this point you at know. this age you know yeah. the eyes the look it's he, just he, like he, like that perfect like when his cheeks start sinking in mm-hmm. at that perfect time he gets that perfect like chiseled look for it he and looks it, like he's carved out of mahogany at certain points like marble he's like you know he's like a greek <laughs> god <laughs> he's a <laughs> he's like uh, a western greek god he's Jesus. like the, the, one of those marble statue face uh stat bust of uh julius caesar you know like like, like old emperors and emperors, shit emperors yeah 
And the eyes. The, eye, the, the, the cold the blue eyes, eyes. The eyes just get you. Dean, don't worry. When you hit that age, that, you're uh, going to get the... Oh, I can't wait for me to get need... old enough that I lose all the baby fat on my face. It's Well, you huh. got to work on that now. But... Uh, it I ain't going to go away. We, we got to stop you, you know, putting you know salt on your butter on your toast. Oh, but that's great. Oh, it's so that, delicious. That, that's how you get the gout. No, nah, it's fine, guys. Uh, Clint Eastwood never ceases to amaze me. It Also, you bring up a good point that... Is this the last, like, maybe not young, because I think he's like 50-something in this, but this is the last, like, he could still kind of play romantic leading man Eastwood before it gets, like, really creepy? Because he still, like, has all of his hair here, but I think he, his hair is gone by the by the turn of the 1990s. Yeah, but he doesn't really play that once he gets to the 90s. He, he kind of knows his... His, his range now? Like, even if you look at, like, Space Cowboy, I think is the, mm-hmm. the one, like, where he has, like, some type of romance. It's like with a middle-aged woman. Yeah, in this movie, you know, he's contending with a a middle-aged woman, someone his age. And then Uh, you have the creepy 15-year-old girl that just will not leave him alone. See, you were were like downplaying the fact that a 15-year-old girl wants to jump this old man's bones. We'll get into that. We will, but but I'm trying to say that, you know, he's not really paying attention to her, but her mother. And it's kind of like, okay, you know, you have two older adults that are, you know, in in a thing with each other. But... Yeah, I mean, I could see where it'd be like, yeah, I've had that where, you know, I was the, the leading man, the love interest, and now it's, you know, I'm the gunslinger. I'm the preacher. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, Which uh, is more interesting than the love story. It's an interesting thing that Eastwood's one of the few actors that I can think of where he actually evolves as an actor as his career goes on. Because you see a lot of actors who are like, the moment they can't play the romantic leading man anymore, they just don't have a career anymore. Or it's very hard to transition, but let, let's actually just tell people what the movie's about. The movie Pale Rider. Yeah, go ahead. Read the back of the... The, the box. The, the Blu-ray. The back of the Blu-ray. God, I, this I movie's have, I own the Blu-ray. To, okay, I was trying to find a physical copy of this movie, <laughs> and, uh, and I can't find it anywhere. And listen, it just it, it's like a VHS copy, this thing. Like, you literally just... And this is by Warner Brothers, mind you. They, they printed this, so it's not like a cheap boot. Like, you put the Blu-ray in, and it goes right to the movie. No, oh. no previews no, or anything? No, right to the movie. Whoa. You don't hit up into the main you go menu? You Warner Brothers, the, the opening for the studio goes in, and you go right into the movie. Literally, like, boom, and then a Malpaso Pictures, and then you, you open up, you know, as you do. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then when it's over, it plays all the bo- all the piracy warnings right after in every <laughs> single language possible. Yeah. And then it ends, You the menu... It's mm-hmm. just, I think uh, it's with when the preacher, ha- ha- it's a wide shot of the preacher with uh, the young Hooper girl on the back of the horse, I think right after he saves her from the, the camp. And You're a spoiler, says, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, this movie's 40 years old. Shut up, exactly. Dean. If you haven't done that, if you haven't watched it by now, I mean, I wouldn't blame you. You, yeah. you, would, you probably didn't know about it. But um, it says, play all trailers. And I'm like, what do you mean? And it goes... Unplay. You could. You have two choices of trailers. For the oh. Play. Oh, okay. oh, okay. Okay. Unforgiven. Oh. And Pale Rider. Then it says, "Visit us online at Warner Brothers Blu-ray DVD online blah, dot com." And then it says, "Play movie." There's not even a chapter selection. <laughs> There's no behind the scenes. You you don't get to choose where you start you your movie. Just... This sounds like a fucking like Chinese knockoff Blu-ray. Are you sure this is a real Blu-ray release? Yes, from Warner Brothers. <laughs> Jesus. It's the only one until they. I guess. Uh, approval and going over the 4k releases of all his movies from warner brothers throughout the year so like on his twitter he's like just approved by clint eastwood <laughs> even though it's his he like he does the tweet yeah yeah it's just approved by clint eastwood the 4k release of this by warner brothers i can't imagine clint eastwood holding his phone and like shooting a tweet out there i can't imagine him doing that that just seems so weird him you know tweeting an approved approved yeah he looks with his tiny glasses kind of holding the phone really far so he can read the screen yeah, approved. All right. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> He's like that fucking song follows me everywhere. But um, but yeah. So uh, here's what the the Pale Rider's about. Mm. In the California foothills, a dispute breaks out between the miners and the wealthy landowner looking to take their plot. But the miners may have a chance when a mysterious preacher arrives on his pale horse, and hell follows with him. Because religious imagery and Clint Eastwood and yada yada yada. Mm-hmm. The plot of the movie is really reminiscent of those 
the really classic westerns, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, village people, they're being taken down by the banker or the landowner or whatever. YMCA. <laughs> the YMCA. Where'd YMCA come in? The village people. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. What well, the village people, you know, <laughs> and in you know, right the disco's coming like, right <laughs> over my head. But yeah, it's such a very classic western like plot and story, but it's mm-hmm. elevated by honestly just Eastwood. Um, implanting that kind of West like mysticism to it because he is a weird character. And this is very dirty for a Western. It's definitely dirty for like a classic Hollywood Western. It's in line with those um, like the seventies revisionist Westerns. Yeah, but you can see uh, what at this point how many gritty little detective action flicks did Clint already direct and star in. Mm-hmm. So you see more of that influence in here. That's why you know the preacher is more of a an action hero yeah when he like in the way he moves than a like a western cowboy preacher that still wears the spurs yeah i'm I'm just like fascinated by clint eastwood's like the preacher character because we never actually get his name we don't even get a real no. backstory from him it's hinted it's all hinted mm-hmm. it's all very it's subtle hinted. like things. i can walk you through it like when you when you first see before we find out he's a preacher he has his whole cuff undone mm-hmm. and his first you know when we finally see him his preacher thing is purposely undone. Like you see the, you see it there, but he doesn't have it done up. Yeah. yeah. And then when he goes in and gets all cleaned up, he puts it all back together. Yeah, because the I'm trying to I'm trying to remember like the flow of the movie because it opens like Conan and the Barbarian where mm-hmm. they raid the the, the village the people. village mm-hmm. people. Yeah, yeah. And, you know they're singing YMCA in yeah. the navy and then they're just being slaughtered. Uh-huh. Um, and then the like leader of the mining camp. Yeah. Right, he goes into the town. The man that bought the plot of land from the mm. California government. Yeah, yeah. He goes into town. He is getting harassed, and then that's the first time we see uh, the preacher. Right, mm-hmm. he shows up, and he's the, you know kicks some ass with an old piece of hickory. Oh, no, 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 no. Am I missing something? So first, it opens up with the village being raided. Yeah, they kill. The young female protagonist dog in here. Yes, the we're gonna gloss that over will, that. That we will hear throughout the entire movie. Yes, mm-hmm. the, the essentially what sets all these things into motion, because without him, uh, without the dog dying, she doesn't go. She doesn't go bury it and say the prayer for, in essence, the God God to send preacher. his preacher or his uh spirit of vengeance. Yeah, which. I really like how the movie is playing on that because it's like that's a super subtle thing. I mean, it gets way less subtle when she starts reading Revelations and then he literally rides into town. But it is kind of interesting because I'm what is it? The movie never makes it explicit whether or not the preacher is a human being like he's. At first, it, it's more or less like, oh, you know, kind of like the good and the bad, the ugly. Yeah, the man with no name. The man mm-hmm. with no name that I think that's what kind of. At least Clint, when he was probably like di- figuring this out with the the duration, was like, you know, like they're gonna see me. We don't need to explain it, like, because he comes with so much baggage as an actor. Just of because at this point he's already been, you know, in the Dollars trilogy. He's always been Dirty Harry. He's already been in Josie Wales. Outlaw yeah. Josie Wales, which I fucking love. Outlaw Josie Wales. That movie slaps. <laughs> um, but. You know, I'm just I'm just trying High to like High Plains Drifter. High Plains Drifter. That's his other one that's really similar to this, Except right? That one's more or less like I'm a fucking ghost. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay, cuz that's another that's one of the other ones I haven't actually um watched before. Yeah. Like you're you're caught up on your Eastwoods, right? Those like lesser known ones like the the Deadpool. I've seen that the detective one in Louisiana. Mm. It if watching that like there's some things in the Deadpool that that Clean Eastwood movie are like Clint directed this? <laughs> like, it, it seems way, like, out there. That's how I felt when I watched Play Misty for me, because there's parts of that movie where they go to, like, a Rams game, I think, or something <laughs> in, like, San... And it's, like, it's literally it just looks like he's walking through the stadium and somebody's just following him with a handheld camera. It looks so fucking weird when I'm, like, you directed Outlaw Josie Wales, and this looks like some, some shit that, like, uh, William Friedkin would pick up in, like, French Connection. <laughs> To each their own. Yeah, to each their own, you know. But yeah. It was the, also the 70s. <laughs> it was the 70s. So, yes. then the, uh, during that prayer, we see him coming out of the 
the far mountains. Yeah, he comes out on the on the snow, and I notice that there's a lot to do with like the nature that's going on because it opens and it's just there's snow everywhere. Yeah. It's very cold, mm-hmm. right? And by the end of it, it's like the snow's kind of melted away. Spring's coming in until the well, it starts with it already going away. Mm-hmm. Like the the snow is there because at the end it's all snow capped mountains yeah yeah so it starts probably at the end of spring like end of winter into spring and ends again he's probably he's probably there for like the what the space of like a couple months probably it's it would seem that way because of how long because they could do a good a job of kind of making it seem like time has passed yeah Mm -hmm. without explicitly saying like it's been months that you've been here (laughs) Oh, preacher! I'm so glad you've been here for six days and fourteen hours. I love <laughs> you, man. I just met a week ago. Ah, uh, that. Let me just, you know, work on my rock calendar over here. Wow, it's been a whole three months since you arrived. How the times are flying, yeah. flown by. I really do like this movie, but there's some parts of the movie that feel like that a little bit. But we're gonna get into it. So, yeah. the preacher finally arrives into town, and he saves the the head minor guy from being attacked by beating yeah. four dudes with a piece of hickory yeah i like how he's spinning it around like he's bruce lee you know <laughs> you know kung fu fighting these guys uh and then that's when he kind of gets invited he's like oh thanks for saving me he takes him back up to the mining camp he's gonna have dinner and that's when we finally see that he's a preacher, a preacher. yeah and uh everyone's like oh, i don't know if we want to have this ruffian for dinner he just beat four men Oh, oh, he's a priest. Oh, that's totally fine. Yeah, Sit down, have a drink. Because his whole collar was undone. Like, he, mm-hmm. like if you look at that first shot of when the the man that was about to be beaten sees him, mm-hmm. like you see the the costuming the is doing a lot of work mm-hmm. there. Yeah, like you see it there because the first shot is just of the collar. Yeah. So he hints at it already. It's just you know we don't we don't expect this from Clint too often. Wow, subtlety from Eastwood? Never, never. Mm-hmm. Two take Clint. That's his name. <laughs> Um, this is also where we get to see his uh, battle scars when he's getting ready for mm-hmm. dinner. Because it's a combination of what? Is it five bullet wounds? Six. Six? Somebody unloaded a whole revolver. Somebody looks like they unloaded a whole revolver like in his chest and they all went through the back. So he should, by all rights, be dead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he's not. Because he's a ghost. And after this, this is just a lot of Eastwood endearing himself to the miners. He helps break up some stones. They're looking for gold. Oh, I got a, I got a couple quotes from him oh. when he comes in. Oh, please, please. <laughs> so when, uh, when the man that owns the camp starts talking to him, he's like, oh, you know, he goes to the preacher and he wants to tell the preacher, look, that woman and I, you know, we're, we're sort of engaged, mm-hmm. but like we're not committing sinful acts. And he tries to plead his case like, you know, but like when we do get married, I want you to do it. Mm-hmm. And he... I love this quote. Clint says, waiting for a woman to make up her mind. You'll be waiting for a long time. I, I, Fair. Mm, mm, strong, <laughs> strong. This man speaking facts. Yes. And then, you know, he's like, oh, well. And then Clint's like, you know, let let me do some work around here. And the guy's like, oh, no. Oh, no. He, I can't we, let a priest do, yeah, do manual if we labor. If some preaching, I'll call you. And I love this line. Clint goes, spirit ain't worth spit without a little exercise. There is there is good writing in this movie. <laughs> yeah, there's like Eastwood can also deliver some pretty corny dialogue and make that shit have weight to it and gravitas. Yeah, he's got game. He's got game. He's got game. <laughs> I mean, Eastwood has like what thirty kids. He's he's got a lot of game. <laughs> yeah, man's still firing live rounds into his fucking eighties. All right. <laughs> I mean, fuck, am I wrong? I mean, I don't think we needed to go that far, but <laughs> wouldn't be you. Ah, uh, you know, ah. Uh, but um, th- what is it? There's also the point where, like, right around this time when he's, you know, uh, helping break out the rocks is where Jaw shows up from mm-hmm. uh, the James Bond movies. Yes, Richard Keel. Yes. Richard Keel. His All right. name is Club here. Club. Club. Ah. Because he, he walks with, like he has a club, club foot. foot. Okay. And he, you know, breaks the rock in one swing, showing he's a badass. And Eastwood's like, I can break some rocks if I really try and <laughs> hits him square in the balls and defeats Club rather easily and yeah. earns his respect yeah well because he didn't kill him and he walked him back to the horse and helped him get back on the yeah. horse the preacher is a kind man mm-hmm. a kind man which even though you know club was incredibly tall they still needed a step stool to get him back onto the horse oh really he wasn't that tall enough that he could just yeah. you know lift him onto they the horse they shot him like andre but he wasn't andre yeah mm. 
Could you imagine? Why couldn't we just get Andre the Giant for this? He was still kicking around, I think. Uh, he was very fat. And very old. And very old. Could barely walk. And then I think they had to replace Keel's horse, his first horse, because I think the horse just couldn't carry him. <laughs> That's well, wild. He, he's a, a big man. I yeah. guess. Uh, I mean, I, my favorite role of his is in, uh, um, I believe it's uh, Happy uh, Gilmore, Gilmore as the construction <laughs> worker. That man, man deserves, you know, more work. Uh, but this is also where we get introduced to, like, the real villains of the piece. We see Chris Penn in a non-tracksuit role. Uh, he's the son of the landowner? Yes, yeah, son of the man that owns the town and the neighboring uh, gold camp. Because I think this takes place towards the end of the gold rush, especially since just by the, the context clues, like uh, the government's kind of more or less banning the way they're mining, the mass mining yeah. way. Yeah. Um, it's it, You can mine, but it has to be... Like old pan panning, and stuff. So, and... It seems like they're the one. Like most of the gold rush has ended, so now it's just people from the east trying to pick up the scraps, and maybe they can figure it out. Yeah, because there's this whole thing about how the landowner guy. Um, I'm gonna forget his name. Isn't he like Lahood? Lahood, yeah, yeah. Uh, or, a strong or name. L.A. Hood on the building. L.A. <laughs> I was yes, like, wow, L.A. Get Hood. A shout, a shout out. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, L.A. Hood, Lahood. He's like this very like, you know, he's eating all this industry. He's doing, um, you know, basically mechanized mining and the miners that are like working that are like our heroes. They're hydraulic like mining, hydraulic as they mining. Refer to it in there. Yes. Hydraulic mining. And it's like, oh, it's big machines. It's a big corporation, all this other stuff. And then you have the regular miners who were like still doing it by hand, salt of the earth kind of people. And there's like something going on there with like class and this and that, you know, the preacher is siding with, you know, the. The real salt of the earth people, not oh, these big guys. No, well, he's siding with the people that are working. Yeah. Like, actually putting in the effort, not just... Mm. Not not just what, what Brandon? <laughs> <laughs> th- th- thank you, thank you. Jizzing all over the land. Just just spraying it everywhere. Yeah. Uh, getting in the hair. Um... Uh, but after after we meet them, there's then it's just a generally just a series of scenes of Eastwood kind of rallying the mining community to fight against the La Hood, yeah, and him endearing himself to everyone. This is around the time we get the daughter being like, I mean, I'll be fifteen in a month. Maybe yo, you can show me what love making is. And this yeah. is around the point where I'm like, all right. All right, Clint, you got to This is a fine line, but with this is not creepy, sir. Go ahead, Dean. Go ahead. No, <laughs> no the fact ahead. he just straight up refuses her. That's that's like, all right. All right. It's not creepy if he straight up refuses her and has no interest, but it's still fucking weird. Well, so the way he treats it is like she doesn't have a true like understanding of love. Yeah. Between like and a fatherly love because mm. as uh, the, the guy that Ho, I think his name Ho. Hull? 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 Hull. There we go. Hull. Hull told him Good in the Hull-y. beginning her dad left her before she was even grown. Like yeah. Before like she could actually... She's got daddy issues. Yeah. So in essence, this is like... That's why he's like, oh, it's fine. It's fine. Everyone loves somebody. Yeah. You know? Like... Loving someone is great. If we all loved each other, we'd have less problems. And like she's like... And then, you know, she also has issues with her mom. Like, my mom was married at 15. Why can't I? <laughs> Uh, uh, the old west. Well, the old west. You know, everyone died by forty-five. So yeah, like, you gotta, you gotta. As pretty much. Going. I mean, probably the La Hood's son was probably the same age, fifteen, and he was running a whole camp. Yeah. And being a bastard at the and same time. A, ba- a bastard with a dad. How about that? Yeah. Oh, who would have known? <laughs> oh. But yeah, so uh, I'm trying to think. Like, what's the what's the next major plot point that? comes up in the movie uh i believe so the, the vote no the vote happens before before they have their you know their talk in the woods yeah. oh it's it's like that that's like the literal scene before that yeah. right oh, okay. it goes they have a okay so we we skipped a few parts there, there's so a lot of parts you skipped movie. an important part actually oh please please so once they endear and chase away everyone starts putting in work it's a whole faith without works type of messages mm-hmm. going on here like mm-hmm. they were all kind of they had no faith that the work the land was going to do anything, so they never really actually ha- tried to find the gold. They they just they assumed just, there was nothing there, so we're just putting in the day's work, and that's we're it. We're here. There's nothing else. 
And then he finds the piece of gold, the little nugget Hall, Hall does. Mm-hmm. And then that inspires the other guys to start working. And so there's a whole new air of confidence now. Um, they go back to town to buy things. And this is where they where uh, the preacher gets to talk to LaHood. Mm. And that's where LaHood makes the offer. Also, I love how that whole conversation is shot because it's all lit from outside mm-hmm. the window so it's so dark inside and it's like oh we're in the belly of the beast like this is mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. not a good place to be and i love how eastwood and la hood there are the preacher and la hood are this conversation kind of like plays out i love the the back and forth like in a rich town like this we could build you a new church and then <laughs> and eastwood's like and some new clothes and la hood goes we'll get them custom tailored and uh. the offering would be mighty big, wouldn't it? And LaHood says, in a rich town like this, wouldn't be the day where you're poor ever again. And Hard to serve God and... Uh, mammon. Mammon. And mammon being money. You can't <laughs> serve God while serving while serving for mammon. Great lines in this movie. So many good good deliveries in this movie. It's the deliveries that really, like, this mm-hmm. is all... Because, you know, I Clint probably saw the budget and was like, all right, we're going to find just go out to a location. No sense in building this in the back lot. Mm-hmm. And we're just going to perform our asses off. Yeah, because the budget for this is like, it's $7 million, which even relative to the 1980s, that's not crazy big. Mm. What is it? Like, uh, I think Rocky was like 6 or $7 million. Mm-hmm. And that was like, you know, in like fucking Philadelphia. They didn't have to build fucking Western sets and shit. And... I'm, again, I really think Eastwood knew exactly what he needed to get, and that was solid performances mm-hmm. and a lot of set dressing. Yep. Like, that's what, that's all he really needed to get the movie to go. So, pretty much, I think they shot on locations, like, in, like, areas where they still preserve, like, the uh, old western town, I think is, like, in Iowa or somewhere where... I, I think so. It's, like, a recreation area where it's, like, preserved. So, like, the town was already there, um, and the mountains were somewhere else, but... It, None of it was shot in the uh, California Sierras. Mm. But the uh, a- after that, that's when he makes the deal, and then he finds out that uh, La Hood's called in a marshal, Stockburn. Yes. And this is where we, f- where we get hints that him and the preacher have had history. There's n- it's just subtle. Yeah, because what is I think uh, La Hood asks Stockburn when the preacher's like walking through town or something. He's like, you know that man? He's like, I might recognize him, but he's too far for me to see his face. You know, there's there's a really subtle hint that um, Stockburn was the one that shot the preacher. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's never, I don't think it's ever explicitly stated. You get like a really heavy, like, no, that's do. probably what's doing it's it at said, the end. It's said? Yeah, yeah, we'll get to there. I think okay. you probably missed it a little bit. I, I might have. Again, uh, so subtle for me. Uh, mm-hmm. Watching this far too late in the night. Oh, um, but to go back to you with the filming, it was shot in Sawtooth National Recreation in Idaho. Idaho. And yeah, Sun yeah. Valley, Idaho. There we go. And there was like a couple places here in California, but mostly Idaho because you get that whole vibe of mm-hmm. there's just nothing. Nothing untouched. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I wonder if the um, California locations were done for like the big establishing shots of like the California mountains. Probably just the. Well, one was the uh, Railtown 1897 State Historic Park in Jamestown, California. So that was the train station that we see okay, where yeah. where they do the um uh what is it when he sends out the um the te- the telegram the, the telegram mm-hmm. yeah and then we also have uh a place in Columbia. I don't know where what they did, but it was Columbia, California. So a couple oh, places okay. here, but mostly on location out of state. Okay. I mean, it pays off for the movie. The movie looks good. Beautiful. Um, I think the, so after that, right? Yeah. That's the, uh, that's when uh, Clint's able to negotiate the, uh, the thousand, term. Thousand dollars for their, pl- for, for each, each man. Mm-hmm. Each claim. They each get a thousand dollars for their claim to leave the land without getting the marshals involved because you you get more hints that they know each other because Clint's like you're gonna spend a lot more mm-hmm. bringing in Stockburn and his gang of marshals than you are just gonna pay these guys the thousand I want you to pay them. Yeah. So more more little subtle hints without ex- a whole exposition. Well, let me tell you. Yeah. About me and Stockburn. I I love the writing in this because it's a lot of you have open to implication. Atten- yeah. And you have to pay attention. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. Like you. I can see why this isn't very like t- 
talked about as a western mm-hmm. because you have to sit down and actually like watch the movie watch the movie or else like if you just kind of glaze over it it just seems like oh a standard western and then at the end you're like like wait what what the fuck did that have to do exactly. with it and then there's the whole thing like it's not even a very action heavy western like we have the big shootout at the end we have the tiny scuffles in the in between mm-hmm. yeah well it's like what two it's like two scu- like scuffles one in the beginning one with club and then a mini like shootout like right before the like, the third act and that's yeah. like it there's mm-hmm. no like gunslinging no riding across the plains hunting down nope. band-aids it's, it's that's it you get a whole lot of dynamite a whole lot of dynamite yes that's a fun the part. climax yeah mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so then they get to the meeting. Yes. And that's, you know, the preacher has inspired so much faith that they're a, they all vote to turn down the off. Mm-hmm. And that's and then that's where we get the um, you know, the uh love scene and then after that, that's when is this the first time we see Stockburn or no, it's when after that that's when the um one miner finds the fucking chunk the yeah. football yeah. of the, gold there's a miner there that used to work for la hood that went with the new camp to kind of make it rich on his own mm-hmm. with his sons and his sons say oh we never go to the town we never go to town yeah our daddy don't let us go to town because they and they're so excited to go to town they're so excited and he and his dad breaks the breaks the rule mm-hmm. of never going back to town it is so interesting that the town in this is like Santa Sanct. You just you just don't go into town. Yeah. Like you never go into town alone. You only go into town to go to like the uh, general store and you well, leave. Hall's the only one that goes to town. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think they even mentioned in uh, in the movie that his daughter's only been to town like they go once a year. Like she will only go like yeah. once a year. Like at the beginning, they all ask him, "You're going back into town again? You mm-hmm. know what happened last time?" So it's it, more or less like. Uh, La Hood harasses him as soon as he comes in, and in hopes that he'll just, you know, fuck it, we're all leaving. Yeah, it's so, like every, if we beat them every time they go into town, then well, <laughs> they, they're gonna run out of something eventually and have to leave. Yeah, he's the only person there that's like kept quote unquote faith throughout the entire thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you saw, you know, everyone kind of build that, and then they go into town, and poor miner. He gets too drunk for his britches. Yep. He's showing That's his off. Big fucking boulder of gold there. La Hood. Koi. His Koi La Hood. That's the name Koi. of it. Koi. Get out of here. And his his in his drunken stupor, you hear his Irish accent. Start out. start sliding through. <laughs> yeah. Which is, you know, Irish. Yeah. Irish man and it's, uh, drunk Irishman. Hey, it's a it's a cross we bear. But it was it's a slight little character thing, like it the accent. Yeah. It's come yeah. out now that he's fucking plastered. And, and that's when we see Stockburn. And the deputies. I like how they're all in like the matching fucking Trench dusters coats. and mm-hmm. the fucking like hats. But I missed one part. And this is the part where you missed about... Uh, see, I'm not the only one who misses this. No, and I, I'm talking about like the timeline. Yeah. It, it, it happens right before he comes out of the... Because they go to town mm-hmm. and then we cut to Stockburn talking with LaHood. Yeah. And LaHood starts describing... The preacher. The preacher. And you see the... He starts describing it, it like in just broad sense of what he did. And like uh says, and, and his eyes. Mm-hmm. And uh, you see the face on Stockburn change. Like Stockburn has a, a sense of recognition. He yeah, knows this guy. Like describe the physical appearance mm-hmm. and boom, boom, boom. And he's like, I, I knew someone back like that. Mm-hmm. Boom, boom. And... Uh, Koi goes, oh, well, then that might be him. And, like, there's, like, a, a long pause there, and he goes, but it couldn't be, because he's dead. Or is he? Dun, dun, dun. I, again, I love all the performances yeah. in this. Because I, I think that entire scene is shot, and LaHood and Stockburn, they're only lit, like, half of their face. They're at the window. They're yeah. at the window, and I, lo- I, I love how, like, I love how this movie looks. It looks fucking beautiful for yes. how like stark it is. Yeah. Um. But uh, where were we? Uh, uh, so then, uh, that's when the the miner comes out, starts yelling at Koi's. The marshals show out, and then we see he's the he's brut- about to dance. Then we see the brutality of that uh, Stockburn preacher described as Stockburn, where they toy with him first, shooting mm-hmm. at the ground to make him dance. And then it, after the dance, quote unquote, Stockburn shoots the gold in half to piss off the miner. 
minor cunts, pulls out the gun, and mm. then they fucking lay his ass, his ass out. Ass yeah. out. Like, just pra pra pra. They, they, they <laughs> unload, like, a comically large amount of bullets they into this man. They unload a... Uh, like a magazine, a, a ma- cylinder, a cylinder each. I I'm, I can't remember. If, I think they only have one gauge each. So it was about what was it, seven or eight men? I think I think it's yeah. like seven. There's an Avengers number of people yeah, there. So we'll so say seven with uh, I think seven bullets apiece. That man got forty nine. <laughs> yeah, lit the fuck he up. Got, he got forty eight to the body at first, and then the final gun was was straight to the the dome, the yeah. dome by a stock burn. Right in front of his sons. Right. Great uh, introduction to the brutality of Stockburn. Because mm-hmm. what is it? He's the last guy to pull his gun out, right? He has his boys do mm-hmm. it, and then he's the he only pulls his gun out to make sure the guy's dead. Yeah. So good. And so that's when he goes, tells the kid, tells the sons, take him back to your, your camp and tell the preacher tomorrow in the morning. And that's when we get... They bring him back to the camp. I'm trying to remember. Is it... Uh, because I think this the is Mama when... Hooper and Hall talking, where she like berates him, or was it after, or was it uh, when they cut to Clint and Mama Hull, uh, Hooper? I think there's a they cut to Clint and Mama Hooper, and okay. then Clint's gonna go and he's gonna pick up his guns. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's that that I think that's the flow of events after this, and yes. then uh, and then uh, she Hull... berates Hull after uh, they bring back the body of um, the miner. Yeah. yeah. That. This is these are all like three scenes that are like stuck oh, right no. together. We fuck no. <laughs> Hall, There's so many it's Hall, hard to recall these movies, right guys? Paul and Mama Hooper um was before they find the, the big gold boulder. Oh yeah, and okay. she's like, Why are you doing Why this? Would we you should tell just these go. Guys, no, you only you convinced them because you don't want to quit. Yeah. And blah blah blah. And like you can see like Throughout the movie, you see that she's a big bitch to everybody. <laughs> like her daughter, she fucking snaps at her. Snaps at this dude that's been trying to help her, and she's just like, "I just want to like go somewhere that has running water and an indoor toilet." <laughs> I want like, a toilet, damn it! God damn it! I want the luxuries in life: so, indoor plumbing. Let's get back. Fast forward now. Now yeah. we see her and uh, preacher talking. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you get the sense that they know each other? No. Are you? Sh- no. I get a little sense that they might have known each other beforehand, but it's real subtle. Just like how she's like talking to him and how she's saying, um, you know, I just I just want to kiss you so I know kind of thing. Like there I, I get a sense that there was that something was the same there. vibe I was picking up on too. I mean, not that like they knew each other like well, but you know, maybe they've seen each other before and it's kind of like I haven't seen you since that one summer's day twenty years ago. There, Never <laughs> forgot you. Again, it there is just it's a real small sense that I feel like they might have known each other before. Because again, the preacher's yeah. backstory is never elaborated well, on, and she's very quiet. I think that's part of the the preacher's. You know, when you kind of realize that he's a ghost, just kind of his, mm-hmm. I guess, presence, his aura. It's very a familiar mm-hmm. presence. Because mm-hmm. um, everyone kind of more or less when he meets him, like talks to him, like ever you're there. Their idea or like perception of him changes all of a sudden, and he's just like, "Oh, you're the preacher." <laughs> oh, you're such a lovely preacher. Yeah. Oh. So, like you know when you know she's just like, "Ah, oh, you, blah blah blah. Why would you ever bring him in?" And, and then she the finds friends. out he's a preacher. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But then, but this is where the part. This is the part where you know he's gonna ride off. Get his guns. Uh, I think he informs the them as he's riding off that they're like. They don't accept your offer, yada, yada, yada. And yeah. he he's riding off, and he's going to get his guns. And everyone thinks the preacher's abandoned him because he didn't tell anybody. Because, of course, you know, the Eastwood doesn't tell anybody where he's going. Nope, no. Yeah. Uh, and then this starts building up where the daughter character, she's, you know, finds out the preacher's left. And she's riding to the um, encampment for La Hood. Mm-hmm. And then Sean Penn, you know, a- attacks her. Right. Yeah. And it's a whole thing, and we're like, "Oh no!" Mm-hmm. And I'm like, "Wait, is this this movie wasn't made in the '70s? I don't think they're going that far." And then you know they don't because Eastwood shows up, and this is our first time he fires a gun in the movie. Yeah. Yes. Expertly gives you know Sean Penn stigmata from at least a hundred yards. Mm-hmm. And I mean, rightfully deserved. Shoot him through the hands. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then this is this is what actually leads us into like the climax because he returns to the camp. Yeah. 
uh, gets all the um, gets like the dynamite. Hulls insists on coming with them, yeah. and they're gonna blow up La the Hood's camp. camp. And they mm-hmm. do. Yeah. Fucking cool, by the way. Mm-hmm. I like it's how. A great uh, scene. Yeah. I, I yeah. like how they're lighting dynamite and they're throwing it, and there's a little tinge in the back of my head where I'm like, they're not throwing real dynamite, are they? I mean, the movie's not that cheap, is it? Is it? No, no, it's not real dynamite. No, no. But it is fucking cool. I do like the big explosions. Yeah. Like, all the machinery explodes. And uh, one of the first payoffs come in here with the uh, with Richard, with Club. With Club, yes. Because yeah, you get a hint at, at the attempted raping where he's yeah, he, about to come he's, in. But, you know, in. He's, like, this is, he's like, this is not what I was signed yeah. up for. And mm-hmm. then uh, Mr. Penn, when he's trying to shoot at uh, Preacher... Club stops him from shooting it and then gives him the, you know, his, tips his hat to tips him. His hat and then and the club just absolutely loves that. He's just like, he noticed me. Yes. Oh, somebody noticed me. Mm-hmm. And then from there, this is where we get the the shootout, right? Yeah, well, he leaves Hull behind. He does, yeah, because he doesn't want Hull to follow because with him and get killed. This is one of our last setups. That get yeah, the, less... the oops, I dropped the dynamite when, you know, we've seen the man, you know, yeah. Flip dynamite and uh-huh. uh, the the handles of the pickaxes. Kung fu pickaxe. He's basically yeah. Bruce Lee with a western hat. Mm-hmm. And per, and then he tells Hall like, "It's for the better. Like, take mm-hmm. care of the girls. I'll see you. Uh, you know, it, it's been fun. Happy trails later, dude." And he goes into town, and first thing he does is go into the uh, I don't know, is it the diner slash general store general kind store. of thing. And that's when you get to see, you know, that's when Stockbridge sees him and he's like, oh, well, I can't see his face. Like, he looks familiar, but his face, I need I, to I see. I don't know. I love how he gets in and he just tells the owners of the general store, it's like, maybe time for you guys to close up. And they're like, oh, and they just fucking leave because no, they know shit's going to happen. Time for you guys to maybe go take a walk. Yeah. Yeah. And. Because it's about to go down. And it does go down. Because what is it? The entire, like. Uh, oh, like Lil Hood's posse bursts in and they just unload mm-hmm. everything they got into an empty room. And then, you know... That's, the, your, that's one of your signs that he isn't, like, physically there. Yeah. Yeah. This is probably the most, like, upfront that, oh, he's not a human. Well, yeah. He's too fast. He's, like... Well, there's been hints every time he would disappear and reappear with his horse. Yeah. Like, they were on his pale horse. <laughs> yeah. And he... And throughout this shootout, uh, the preacher is never in, like, any real danger. He always kind of, like, disappears. He Because he appears here, shoots all, like, four or five of those guys just dead. Like, strategically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then when um, Stockburn's men, you know, they, they come out, and it's like, where is he? All that's left is his hat just yeah. sitting in the middle of the road. Yeah, and you're like, where the fuck did he go? Yeah, because we see the shot of the hat, and then we move. Like, it doesn't cut, we just move. And then the hat's on the on the ground. On the ground, mm-hmm. and we're following each of La Hood's men at, or uh, Stockburn's men as they're going through the town, hunting down uh, the preacher, the pale rider, and each one is just getting systematically killed. And it's like, like the preacher is like teleporting, like he's like Jason it's, yeah, Voorhees it's, it's, just it's, coming it's around. He, like, so we see it. It's like the transformation. Like we see him become from like a spirit of vengeance to a messenger of faith back into a spirit of vengeance. Mm-hmm. Like when he uh, goes back, like at the beginning, you, we see him avenge yeah. Hull. Yeah. He becomes a preacher and that's when he kind of essentially gives more faith to the camp. Mm-hmm. One of those, uh, we'll call him, uh, people of his church die essentially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He trades, literally goes to the bank to trade in his, his, his collar, collar for his gun for his, guns. for his vengeance again. He trade he trades in his faith for his sword, and he shall smite down the sinners. Well, he's a messenger of God, and mm-hmm. at first he came with you know he came with an olive branch, and yeah. now he comes with the sword. Yeah, you know, quote, quotes that uh famous verse from Jesus: "Next time I come back, it is uh, I come not in peace, but with a sword." Strong. Yeah. Jesus had had bars. Bars. <laughs> bars, and. It all culminates in the final showdown with Stockburn and the Preacher. And I love this how... This is the most subtle showdown of all time. It's like... It's so fucking... I love how, how the Preacher just walks at him and he just drops the cylinder out, reloads as he's staring Stockburn. And now Stockburn's just, got his shit ready to go. And goes... And lets Stockburn look him in. Like, he lifts his face up. 
And it's mm. so subtle because you see the shadow slowly disappear. And like he looks at Stockburn and Stockburn goes, you, at first. Like a, yes. like a ghost. <laughs> yeah, like he's seen a ghost. And then it takes another second and he goes, you. And then they fucking draw. And it's and then, you know, fucking and the preacher just. But he shoots him in the same exact position mm-hmm. as that he has his, his bullets. Yeah. I love I love that so much. And then it's like, oh, oh, I, I understand this now. And also, I love how Stockburn, when he you know falls down, he has all the bullet holes. He's still like clinging on. He and still he wants to shoot him. Exact way he probably killed the preacher. Yeah. Yeah. With the dome to the head. And right at this point, this is when LaHood, he's watching from his little office. Um, little office. office. And he's like, oh, I better get out. And he turns. And who's there to get LaHood but Hall? Mm-hmm. Shoots him with his big ass buffalo gun. Ends his... Ends it. He flies out the window because everyone has to fly out a window in a western movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. And like, he did it. I love the one liner from uh, that Clint delivers. You know, preach it a whole long walk. <laughs> and he's like, my legs are killing me. Uh, <laughs> I love running that. down that mountain. There's so many good one liners in this. It's so much fun. And uh, but the movie finally culminates the pale rider gets back on his pale horse and rides off back up into the mountain he ascends back up the mountain but at this point we forgot it's all snow capped everywhere yeah Yeah. it's beautiful this this thing Uh, it's gorgeous fuck it like gorgeous cinematography looking at the cinematography like it just made me smile every time we got one of those landscape shots Mm -hmm. in the town oh the opening where they're where they're actually like riding out over the hills and you see that big golden plain the Mm -hmm. big hills that she's in the background the blue Mm -hmm. sky I'm like, man, I'm really glad I didn't watch the VHS rip of this movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of how it uh, ties itself up. But I need to know, like, Pale Rider, where does this sit in your Eastwood canon for you? Is this, is this a high Eastwood? Is this a, is this a mid-Eastwood? Uh, I, it's, I don't think it's a, it's not a bad Eastwood. No, it's no. a really good movie. It's very good. I would put it up there like, you know, we got... S tier Eastwood mm-hmm. A B C and then F's right yeah yeah even though the F's you know like Eastwood doesn't make like out and out terrible movies no. some of them are just a little eh, and not my taste yeah. yeah especially those like detective action ones during the eighties and seventies like yeah depending on the writing is how they aged um I would say it's like A tier it's really good I give it an A tier it's like. Same. I mean, for being his 14th film with Warner Brothers, where it could have been, yeah, you know, just shoot on our back lot. Yeah. It doesn't feel like a Warner Brothers movie. And mm-hmm. I think if they had shot there, we would have had something completely different. This just felt very organic. Reminded me a lot of Buck and the Preacher, where you just you yeah. feel like you are out in the there. elements with these people. Mm-hmm. It's also interesting, like talking about like the Eastwood directing style, because Eastwood's like has a very specific style of working. At this point, he was doing a lot of just, like, detective thrillers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I tried to figure out, like, the Eastwood career arc a little bit, because his 60s, he, like, kind of breaks out, but he doesn't start directing until the 70s. And Do you know why he kind of stopped with the the Western stuff? uh, Not, I I just assumed it was because Western stopped being profitable. No, he actually had a midlife allergy where he became allergic to horses. So he had to kind of, like, for my health, I need to, you know, stop doing this. That's wild. I mean, I'm glad he came back because, like, I'm I'm going to say this. Pale Rider, A-tier, Eastwood, Western, acting, directing. Unforgiven, S-tier. That is one of my favorite Westerns well, that, ever. Th- that's like a full, like, studio behind him. Like, he has the he budget. He has everything he to, needs. To even do set pieces in. Like, you could tell, like, they pretty much told Clint, hey, make a Western, but. Yeah. You, we. We got a we got a penny pinch here, buddy. Like he, he's like westerns haven't been solid since the last one you made like a decade ago. You gotta you gotta show up for this Eastwood. You and know, I mean, this was a real a real western because I guess he sustained his worst like working injury on this movie <laughs> where he got thrown from his horse because he was riding over ice and the ice broke and the horse went into the water. Well, it was yeah. probably during those like when in the mountain scenes because you see mm-hmm. it in the. In the yeah. credits where, like, the horse almost slips. Yeah. 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 That's why they show, you know, sometimes he's, you know, pulling from the left instead of, you know, yeah. shooting from the right because he dislocated his shoulder. So it's like, yeah, this movie uh, came with its lumps, but 
It provided. Oh, yeah. I mean, you don't see the difficulty on screen. Like, no. I, I do not read a low budget out of this. No. I mean, $7 million in, what is it, 85 That's not, like, super low, but it's For not, Western, like... For Western, at that point, it was because I think, you know, they were building sets. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, like, it was set pieces were expected. Yeah. You, uh, I mean, the explosions and stuff like that near the end, the shootout, that, that required a, probably a little bit of money into that. I mean, setting up the whole mining operation for La Hood's people, mm-hmm. that's a big piece of property and all the, the tools that you need to have to make it look like an operating yeah. facility. Yeah. It is just a thing where it's just like, it's so fascinating that this is also, it was the highest grossing Western of the 80s. Mm-hmm. It was pretty much the last studio Western of the 1980s, like at all, right? So I think so. So I'm looking at it and I'm like, why was this the the standard? I mean, it is a good movie. <laughs> like, don't get me wrong, but it's like highest grossing at forty two million dollars. Yeah. yeah, like Tootsie made like what eighty fucking millions. Like, d- it was just a sign of the times. Because I mean, by the time we get to the eighties, you know, it's a lot of um, teen movies, comedy, action movies, action movies. So it's kind of like we've moved on from the western. Yeah, I mean it's. I mean, to get into a whole can of worms, like, Western fatigue became, like, a real thing yeah, so, in, in the 70s and 80s. So, here's a comparison to, like, another, eight, like, the, the famous 80s Western flop, mm. which is also a waste of money to buy on fucking... Uh, <laughs> oh, God. Are you still mad you bought that? I'm not mad that I bought it. I bought it for... It was on Amazon for clearance on Criterion, but Heaven's uh, Gate... Ah, uh, uh, Heaven's Gate. It's, uh... And who would like to guess the budget on it? Oh, cause that one's the one that sunk United Artists, right? Yeah, 1980. This is what essentially killed United Artists and any hopes for Westerns for like 10 years. 15 mil? 15. Uh, God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go big. Uh, uh, 35. Both of you guys are still way under. Way Whoa. under. 44 million dollars. 44. Wow. And only made three point. Five million dollars. Oh, sweet Christ! Okay, that explains why no one wanted to touch a fucking Wester. And that's why I think about how much they gave Clint six point eight seven. Yeah, just yeah. enough to like. All right, if we lose it, it's not going to kill us. It's a small us. little rise mm-hmm. right off. If we make three and a half million, we consider that a a win. It, it's also a thing where it's like you're Clint Eastwood. We can just sell you at the fucking drive-ins, and we'll make ten. Yeah, like that's like you you could. That's the thing. Clint Eastwood even now is is still a movie star. You can sell a movie off of Clint Eastwood's name, <laughs> right? Like he, Eastwood's mo- movies still make money. Granted, yeah. they're cheap as hell because he only does like one or two takes for everything. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, but um, I Heaven, Heaven's Gate actually killed the westerns like financially. But I also think it's just people were kind of done with westerns after a while. It's kind of the same thing yeah. now with the Marvel movies. People are just kind of done mm-hmm. with the superhero so genre. That, that's why, more or less, he got, like, it was a small budget for a Western. Because mm. Unforgiven, I think, was probably, like, 20? I don't even... I don't think it was 20. Oh, I think again. Unforgiven... I think Unforgiven tops fucking 15. Tops 15. Oh, you're, we'll you're, see. You're, I, I see. I see Becky over there pondering. She's like, when was the last time I saw Unforgiven? It's Fuck. been a long time. <laughs> No, yeah, fourteen point four million. He's um, good, mm, right here, baby. Yeah, but so. even even then, that's still like pretty fucking low for a, like a studio tentpole film. Yeah, right. I, but you, on that one, you don't get a big a- action thing until like you get a small set piece in the middle mm-hmm. when they're like trying to kick the rust off, mm-hmm. and then it's not till the end. And in the end, it's a lot of just Clint and Hackman just going at it. Also, that's probably where the money went to is the cast of Hackman, mm-hmm. Morgan Freeman. But Morgan wasn't like the the super superstar at that point. He, I think he was Oscar nominated or winner at this point for Driving Miss Daisy. I think like he had name value. He had that, name, but it, was this after Shawshank? Was no Shawshank was ninety four. I think yeah, Shawshank is okay. what blew Shawshank him. blew him they, way the fuck yeah. up. Yeah, like I don't think he was a, a big like commodity because there's a lot of actors that won the Oscar that. Didn't go mm-hmm. on to have yeah. Morgan Freeman's Especially longevity. Especially for Driving Miss Daisy, like yeah, yeah. it's one yeah. of those films where he gave a great performance at your award, and you mm-hmm. ask somebody, you, Driving Miss Daisy, you know who was in it? And they're like, "That's the movie where the they drive the the old lady, right?" 
Jesus. I, oh, God. Well, speaking of Jesus, you know, later Morgan Freeman would become God. Yeah. All ties together. It All does. All ties together. But yeah, like, pro- well, Hackman probably wasn't cheap either, but that's a whole other thing. But yeah, like, I really dug Pale Rider. This yeah. is a good movie. This is a good pick. Same. I mean, I really love the the ending of the movie with the deputies mm-hmm. and him just, you know, popping out from behind crates, <laughs> laying in a trough. It was just, you know, really cool stuff. Oh. I really enjoyed it. But Brandon, you have any final thoughts on Pale Rider? I don't know. I love, I love it. I love this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Is it fav- favorite Eastwood? One of them, yeah, up there. Ah, solid. I, I'm, I'm always happy when uh, we get to bring you in for movies you actually like. Those are, those are the best kind of movies. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, the Scorpion King was fun to talk about, or we, was it? Oh. Da, 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 da. Well, the world never know. On, on the lowest of keys, uh, I did buy the Scorpion King like franchise collection we might bring you back in we'll just do all the for all the scorpion oh, kings ready. Your, ready. is your is your body ready for the glory of dwayne the rock johnson for one movie and none of the other five and the rest of the wwe cameos uh <laughs> randy couture's in the second one i think he's in the second and the third one but yeah i but uh we'll get to that but um so we don't have anything to plug for next week because we don't know what we're talking about next week because we're, we're just keeping it up in the air yeah, we we don't know what we're going to talk about. But if you wanted to find out what we're talking about or listen to some of our other episodes, where can they go? You could follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and you could even follow us on YouTube. You can follow us on YouTube at the Film Vault. That's the Film Vault on YouTube, where you can like, comment, subscribe, and check out the slideshow versions of this podcast. I'm actually releasing episodes now. That's great. We're finally doing it. But if you want to find out if we're doing anything else, you can check us out on our Instagram at... The Film Club Podcast, where we post daily stories, upcoming episodes, random adventures we go on. But before we go, Brandon, would you like to plug anything? Uh, sure. We have a small plug, a preview of what is to come. Yes, we do. Uh, me and Dean. Dean has written, uh, has completed a unfinished script. He has essentially put the, the meat onto the skeleton. Uh yeah, that, that's a good way to put <laughs> yeah. it. it uh, the skeleton was already there. I just kind of finished, well, you know, tied the room together. Yeah, and now we're getting ready to put the heartbeat in the thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're making a little short film, uh, off of a script that was written from a friend that unfortunately passed away. Yes. Mm-hmm. So this is our way of honoring him, and uh, there will be more to come, I'm sure. But yep. exciting things coming. Dean, the writer, is <laughs> is going to be showcased here, really. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, But, yeah, we're going to be doing that uh, shooting in December. December, first couple weeks. Yeah, hopefully um, finish release in February, March, something like that. Depending on quality. Uh, Depending on um, our editors who who are totally going to be on time. We will be on them like slave drivers. (laughs) That's all I... Me and Dean have got in the, the material to sit there and whip this thing into production look out for that everybody but with that we'll see you next week at the film club have a good week everybody